Welcome to Reflections on Rejection. Thank you for all for being here this evening. My name is Ann Browning, and I'm the Director of Academic Support Programs in Undergraduate Academic Affairs, and I also coordinate the UW's Resilience Lab. Tonight is our second Fail Forward Reflections on Rejection panel. From our faculty panel last spring, we learned that the closeness and connections we have as a community are expanded when we get real and share our whole story. When we have the courage to be honest about who we are and what we have lived through and how that shapes our perspectives, we learn that we are not alone in facing hardship. We live curated existences. We put literal and figurative filters on the images of our lives that we share with others. That process of editing can leave us with the impression that our friends and acquaintances I have lives that are filled with delicious meals and, and smiling selfies and vibrant sunsets. And by comparison, our own lives can feel a little bit muted. Tonight's event is about pulling back some of those filters. It's about sharing the good, but understanding that the wins come from reckoning with the losses we have faced. Resilience is about bouncing back from struggles and setbacks, but it's also an approach to being boundless to being willing to take a chance, knowing that things might not turn out the way we want, but realizing that what we learn from those challenges and rejections can be more powerful lessons than the ones we learn from playing it safe and taking the easy path. The goal of the Resilience Lab's work is to look at our own approaches to risk taking, to pushing ourselves up against the edge of what we are of our own abilities, which is where we learn the most. Tonight you will hear from three amazing coaches about their successes and the challenges they've faced along the way. I'm joined on stage tonight by my colleague and co-facilitator and friend, Ed Taylor, Dean and Vice Provost of Undergraduate Academic Affairs. Welcome. I also have the honor of introducing our coaches, Heather Tarr. <laughs> Leslie Gallimore, and Lorenzo Romar. I'll read each coach's biography, highlighting their resumes of success. And I'll let you know that these folks have seen some success in their days, so this bit will take a minute. I'll start with Heather Tarr. Heather Tarr is in her 12th year as the head coach of the UW softball program. At the age of 12, Tar was in the All-Star Redmond Little League City Championship and was the only girl playing in that league. After the opposing pitcher intentionally walked the batter in front of her so he could pitch to a girl, she stepped up to the batter's box and crushed the first offering over the fence for a Grand Slam home run. That is big time. It's <laughs> <That is> big time. <laughs> In high school, Tar played varsity ba volleyball, basketball, and softball. She was team captain, all league, all King County, in all three sports. She was also a member of the National Honor Society academically, and in her spare time, she was a ski instructor at Alpental. She was presented with an opportunity as a recruited walk-on at the new softball program at the University of Washington, but earned a full scholarship by her senior year. She became a four-year letter winner as a student athlete at UW, where she helped lead the dogs to a second place finish at the Women's College World Series in 1996 and a third place finish in 97. She earned various honors while playing softball at Washington, a three-year member of the Pac-10 All-Academic Team from 94 to 97. She was named to the Pac-10 All-Conference Team from 95 to 97 and the NFCA All-West Regional Team in 96 and 97. She earned a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Geography from the University of Washington in 1998. Tar competed the summer after graduating from UW in the Women's Professional Softball League as a member of the Tampa Bay Fire Sticks. She was the league leader in fielding percentage for first baseman and also led the league in walks. While living in Tampa, Florida, the head coach of the University of the Pacific phoned and offered Tar an opportunity as an assistant softball coach. She spent six years at Pacific helping build the program to a 50-win season, falling just one game short of the Women's College World Series. 
During her tenure at the University of Pacific, she completed her, uh, her master's degree in education in the fall of 2003. In 2004, she became the head coach at the University of Washington, uh, Washington softball team at the insanely young age of 29. Tar has compiled an overall record of 443 wins, 196 losses, and one tie. And I didn't even know you could tie in softball. In 2015, Tar led the Huskies to their 22nd consecutive appearance in the NCAA postseason tournament and the 11th straight win with her, or 11th straight with her at the helm. Tar has guided the Huskies to the Women's College World Series four times, including in 2009 when the Huskies won the national championship. In 2009 and 10, she coached the National Player of the Year, Danielle Laurie. And in 11 seasons, Tar has developed over 15 All-Americans and was named Pacific Regional Coach and National Coach of the Year in 2009. Tar has been happily married for four years to the son of her Little League baseball coach. They have, had a, they have been lifelong friends and are now partners. Welcome, Heather Tar. <laughs> Leslie Gallimore. Leslie Gallimore is in her 22nd season as the head women's soccer coach at the University of Washington, making her the longest tenured women's soccer coach in, Pac in the Pac-12 and the third longest tenured head coach at Washington. Gallimore earned her BS in psychology from the University of California, Berkeley in 1986. She started on the women's soccer team at Cal and was a four-time All-American from 82 to 85. She led the Golden Bears to a Final Four appearance in 84 and was recognized as one of the top 10 female soccer players in the U.S. in 1985. At the end of her collegiate playing career, Gallimore was honored as the Cal Women's Intercollegiate Athlete of the Decade from 76 to 86. She was a member of the Cal Athletics Hall of Fame and was inducted in 1995. Gallimore also received the Jake Gimble Award at Cal for Excellence in Athletic Attitude. She was the president of Cal's Women's Soccer Club as a freshman and helped advocate for the NCAA varsity status for the sport. As a senior, she was awarded one of Cal's first women's soccer scholarships, a stipend of $500. Gallimore was also inducted into Cal's inaugural class of the Cal Soccer Layer of Legends in the spring of 2015 and was uh, most recently named to the Pac-12 All-Century Team as one of their starting 11. I'll pause on that. That means the Pac-12 All-Century team for 100 years of Pac-12 play, she was considered to be the best right back that ever played. <laughs> Gallimore won several US Olympic Festival medals, both as a player and a coach, but was also a US amateur champion on four occasions. As a coach, Gallimore led the Huskies to multiple NCAA tournaments in her tenure and has twice reached the Elite Eight, won a, the Pac-10 conference title in 2000, the same year she was named Soccer Buzz's National Coach of the Year. She's coached with the United States National Team programs, the Youth De uh, Olympic Development Program teams, which about 20 years ago she actually had the, uh, I'll call it, pleasure of coaching me on and began her coaching career as an assistant at her alma mater for four seasons before getting her first head coaching job at San Diego State University where she coached before being named Washington's second head coach in the program's history in 94. Gallimore is a national staff instructor for the US Soccer Federation and amongst the elite coaching educators in this country. In 2012, Gallimore was a guest of the U.S. Embassy and State Department in Morocco as a uh, member of their sports envoy. Gallimore has served on several NCAA committees and has chaired the Women's Committee of the National Soccer Coaches Association of America. She serves on its board of directors and will rotate into the presidency in January of 2018. Gallimore was honored in January of 2013 with the NSCAA Women's Committee Award for Excellence for a contribution to the women's game. Gallimore has a 22-year-old son, Zachary, who is a Lance Corporal in the United States Marine Corps stationed in Okinawa, Japan. Zach, Zach was Leslie's nephew, whom she brought to live with her when he was in the third grade and then adopted him as her son on December 17th of 2004. 
Zach is married and expecting his first child, a daughter, in January of 2016. Welcome, Leslie. <laughs> One more. <laughs> Lorenzo Romar. Lorenzo Romar is coaching in his 14th season with the Huskies men's basketball program, but his athletic prowess has not been limited to basketball. In a little league all-star game, Romar once struck out 16 batters. He earned a partial academic scholarship to Pius X High School in Downey, California as a, as a result of a high score on a placement test. Following a decorated high school career, basketball career, Romar played two years at Cerritos College where he was the MVP and team captain. Romar was awarded an athletic scholarship to the University of Washington where he played for the legendary coach Marv Harshman. He was voted most inspirational both years and captain his senior year. He was drafted in the seventh round by the Golden State Warriors and played five years in the NBA. In the NBA, he was the top 10 in assist leaders at one point during the 1982-83 season. After the 84-85 season, Romar joined Athletes in Action, AIA, where he set single game records for most points and assists. He remains the team's all-time assist leader and ranks second in all-time scoring. In 1992, Romar scored 45 points against Michigan's Fab Five freshman, who went on to reach the NCAA championship game in 1989. <clears throat> Romar took on co-head coaching duties for AIA in addition to his continued responsibilities as a player. Romar served during the summer of 1997 as an assistant under Rick Mayhewers for the United States 22 and under team that competed at the World Championships in Melbourne, Australia. Romar was then hired on as an assistant coach at UCLA under Jim Harrick from 92 to 96 and was credited with recruiting many of the players on the 1995 national championship team. Romar became the head coach at Pepperdine University and then at St. Louis University before taking the job at the University of Washington in 2002. During three-year tenures at Pepperdine and St. Louis, he gained a reputation as a hardworking coach admired for integrity and dedication. At both Pepperdine and St. Louis, Romer helped to revive programs to a competitive level. In St. Louis, they won the only conference tournament championship in program history, including four wins in four days in 2000. Romar has 19 years of experience as an NCAA head coach with 13 years of leading the Huskies basketball team under his belt. Lorenzo Romar has earned the distinction as the Pac-12's longest tenured coach and has amassed 270 wins at the UW. In his time at Washington, Romar has lifted the Huskies to an elite level and unprecedented success. They've had six NCAA tournament appearances, three Sweet 16s, three Pac-10 tournament championships, two regular season Pac-10-12 titles, and two national invitation tournaments that included a semifinal appearance in 2012. Coach Romar has been happily married to his beautiful wife, Leona, for 32 years. He helped raise their three daughters who have all finished college and are thriving in society. Welcome, Coach Romar. Now, I'm supposed to say that that is a typical way of, of introducing um, coaches and scholars, but there's nothing typical about what I just heard. Could you give them another round of applause? For, for... A grand slam, really? <laughs> so now, now we want to flip the resume as, as impressive as that is and ask, each of our coaches, and, and they do happen to be three of, of my favorite coaches, really, in, in the country. Um, but now's a moment for us to ask them to, to flip that resume and talk about moments in which they've come up short, um, ways in which you, if we could use the term, um, encountered failure. Heather, please. Thank you. In 1987, I experienced a lot of teasing because I was the only girl on the Little League team, and I looked like a boy with my hat on, you couldn't tell the difference. So a lot of times I would hear comments about either, oh, he's this, he's that. So that was very hard to deal with as a young, a young person. But I also experienced um, you know, 
teasing in terms of, oh, you're a girl, you can't do this, you can't do that. And a lot of, a lot of experiences in my life came, um, came as a, a, a young girl being teased. So that was, that was my experience as a 12-year-old. And then I tried to overcome being the girl that looked like a boy by wearing a jean skirt at an open, opening ceremonies of the Little League World Series and tried to wear these cool Mickey Mouse earrings and make sure everybody knew I was a girl. But then they, I just continued to get laughed at, like, oh, why is that boy wearing a jean skirt? Why, are they, why is he wearing earrings? So um, I had a bunch of friends in high school. Even though I was all King Co., I played every sport. Every one of my friends that I played softball with got recruited, received almost a full-ride scholarship to go to their dream school. My opportunity came as a walk-on, which was a no-scholarship athlete at the time at the University of Washington. As a freshman in 1994 playing softball at the University of Washington, I was a starter at third base, thinking I was pretty good. And in March, halfway through the season, I lost my starting position and didn't play again. In August of 2000, while I was getting my master's at the University of the Pacific, as an assistant coach, I went home to, to Seattle, visited my family on a surprise mission to say hi to my mom and dad, and I lost my boyfriend to a car accident while I was gone. And uh, I thought I was just gonna leave, leave Pacific, go home, come to Seattle, be in the comforts of mom and dad, but I stayed there, finished, finished my last four years, and it was um, a success. In pursuit of a head coaching job in 2003, while I was at Pacific, I was a finalist for the Nevada head coaching position and was called and told, you don't have any head coaching experience, so we're choosing someone else. Then, in the spring of 2004, at my alma mater here at Washington, I knew there was a job opening for head coach here for uh, the program that I played in, thinking I was this high and mighty assistant coach. Okay, I interviewed for the Nevada, Nevada coaching position. I've got some experience doing that. I've got great experience being a, a, a very accomplished assistant coach. I'm the most accomplished University of Washington softball alumni out there right now. Here's my resume, follow through, put it through the electronic system for two and a half months, no phone call, no email, no response back. I despise talking about myself, and my battery's about to die. Um, so I'm going to do my best Bob Dole. Is anyone here old enough to know who Bob Dole is? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do my best Bob Dole impersonation and speak about myself in the third person. Um, as one of the most decorated players in Division I women's soccer history, Gallimore never earned an appearance for the U.S. women's national team but instead only made it as far as the USB team that competed against the full team in warm-up matches. After studying biology for two and a half years at Cal, Gallimore switched courses to become a psychology major. This change was prompted by two summers spent working at her stepfather's medical lab in Beverly Hills, a job from which she was eventually fired for incompetence in calibrating and testing urine and blood samples. <laughs> After graduation from UC Berkeley and while working as an assistant coach there, Gallimore attended Golden Gate Law School in San Francisco from 1987 to 88. And after completing her first year, much to her parents' chagrin and after a lot of therapy and to their, her parents' surprise, quit to pursue her very unlucrative coaching and playing career. After coaching at San Diego State for one season, Gallimore interviewed for the newly created program at the University of Washington. She did not get the job, only a phone interview. Gallimore also finished second for the head coaching job at Stanford in 1993. Gallimore's biggest failure came following one of her team's most successful seasons at the University of Washington. In 2004, the Husky women's soccer team made it to the Elite Eight, enjoyed its most successful season to date. The following year in 2005, Gallimore's Husky squad went from best in the country to worst, finishing 0-17-3, losing 14 matches by one goal. Gallimore was amazingly retained as the head coach at UW, <laughs> but took upwards of three seasons to get the program back into the NC2A tournament. Since that time, Washington enjoyed another Elite Eight appearance in 2010 and has placed several players into the national team and pro ranks.
So if, uh, if you heard that it was mentioned that uh, I, I did well on a placement test on my way to high school uh, enough to where I was given a partial scholarship to the high school, the private school that I was going to. Uh, right after that, I don't know if I got complacent. No, I know what it was. I just uh, didn't take school seriously enough. I was uh, able to do it. I was competent enough based on the results of the test. But uh, I enjoyed sports so much and some other things that uh, neglected my studies. After two years at what was called Verbum Day High School, they were about to ask me to leave the school. But our, my parents moved to another part of town, which was Compton, California. While that was going on in the ninth and 10th grade, my love at the time, and still is, but I mean, my, like my only love was basketball at the time, over anything. And uh, I went out for the varsity team as a sophomore and got cut. And the next day, I went out for the junior varsity team and got cut again. Uh, two days in a row, I got cut by both teams. I ended up playing on what was called the sophomore team, the B team. They were just, we weren't very good, very good players. So uh, we did that, transferred schools, went to another one. And now this academic thing was getting out of control because uh, I would use all three lunches, my lunch and two others from others, to stay out on the schoolyard and play basketball. As a result, uh, my senior year, I uh, walked up like everyone else did and walked in front of the stage on graduation day. They just did, there was no diploma inside of the little case they gave me because I had not met all my requirements yet. Uh, basketball was. I was still in love with basketball, but that wasn't going too well either because uh, I wasn't getting any offers. No one knew who I was. There was no interest. I went on and tried. I walked on at a community college seven miles from my house called Cerritos Community College. My freshman year, it caught up with me in the classroom. I was academically ineligible after the first semester, and I wasn't playing getting a whole lot of time on the basketball floor. It was really, really a rough time for me. The next year, after I spent the summer realizing that I had to do a much better job in school to at least be eligible to play, I improved to a point where I was the most valuable player of our team, given a scholarship to University of Washington. And I came to University of Washington and repeated the same the same behavior in the classroom. I was negligent in the classroom, did not finish at the time, did, my, did not get uh, my degree at the time, and averaged a whopping 9.4 points a game my senior year playing here at the University of Washington. The pros weren't exactly beating down my door, and a number of my classmates here at the University of Washington uh, as my dreams were playing on playing in the NBA were asking me what I was going to do next year. And obviously in their mind, they thought I had no and felt I had no shot to play. I went on and fortunately worked really hard uh, to make it. I was able to play four years and then within one year after that was cut from three different teams from the NBA. I went on to coach. First year I was in coaching, I was an assistant at UCLA. High profile, pressure cooker type of environment. They want the best. If you lose one game, they're ready to take you to the firing squad. And I was supposed to be a guy to come in and help them get players. The first year that I was there, uh, in the first, what's called an early signing period, it's the, uh, when you're trying to get these recruits, these guys to come to your school, we signed zero. No one came at all. So the head coach that hired me was under a lot of criticism. Why did you ever hire him in the first place? He's not doing anything for you. Uh, eventually, I went on to become uh, a head coach. And I was at Pepperdine and then St. Louis. And then there was an opportunity to come to the University of Washington to be the head coach here. And there were four three or four candidates that turned the job down, and then they settled on me. <laughs> you are
coaches, you are mothers, you are fathers, you are husbands and wives. You, you heard the echoes of, um, you, you can't do this. And, and you look kind of boyish. Why is that boy wearing a jean skirt, they said. So you walked on. You, you applied, but they never called. But they never called. Gallimore, you, you, you did not get that job you, you wanted. And, and, and you went from, from the best, from the very best, to the worst, and, and yet, and, and yet, for some reason, they retained you. Um, Verbum day, they came close to asking you to leave. And you, and you got cut, and then you got cut again. Um, and you opened your diploma, the case of the diploma, and looked inside, and there was nothing in it. Yeah. Um, and, and you've had moments when you've been at the top, and there are moments when you've been questioned. And, and not just privately, but such is the nature of your, of your industry. You've been questioned publicly, but yet, but, but yet, you model, you, you coach, and, and you come back. So we, we read your success resumes. Tell, tell us what it was like, in, in each of you, in whatever order you'd like, what was it like to, to talk about your your failures, the times you've come up short. Here I go. It was, it was difficult at first to come up with which ones were, they were significant to me personally, but which ones were significant in, in all, and which ones could, did I have to overcome? And it was hard to think about the failures, actually. It was difficult for me to think back I've probably failed a lot more than what I conveyed, but those are the things that stood out to me in my life when I failed, so it was, it was a difficult task for me to think about it. I think, for me, failure is such a, it's a, it's a weird word. I mean, there's times where, when you're thinking about failing, sometimes it's on you and sometimes it's not on you. So it's, you think about what part of it you controlled and what part of it you didn't control and it just didn't happen for you. Maybe your expectations weren't met. Um, but when it is on you and you legitimately feel like you failed, um, I'm older than Heather so I can say this, is that talking about it is actually a little bit freeing, to be honest. Um, you get to an age where you just, you kind of let go of some things. You don't, um, you don't feel as badly anymore, especially if you've kind of come out the other side. Uh, you can look back and when the wound isn't as fresh or you don't feel as hurt by it, when you, you have um, hung around or come back or, or learned from it, it's really freeing to be able to talk about it. I mean, you know, I'm a big believer if, you know, if you don't laugh, you'll cry. So why, laughing is usually the better part. I mean, not winning one game and living through that and more importantly looking at the kids' faces on your team who are out there every day working hard for you, it is a rough thing to stomach. Um, and then having that be on you and to have the public scrutiny, um, it's, it's difficult. But to be able to talk about it and share it and sort of reason as to why it happened and to get out the other side of it, it's, it's to me freeing to be able to talk about it. I would say uh, from an academic standpoint, uh, my failures were self-inflicted and I have no one to blame but myself. But when you talk about the athletic side and the coaching side, uh, I was never a superstar. I was never the young stud that everybody was after. I was always climbing, trying to chase my dream. Uh, yeah, I played basketball for a very long time and played in the NBA for five years. But once I reached the ninth grade, all of those years, I was only a full-time starter one year. I never started for a team the entire year, except for once. As a result of all of this, uh, I've been able to persevere and understand that uh, I can't really truly uh, enjoy my, my success without the failure. I think when you understand how much you've failed and how hard you've worked, you appreciate the successes a 
whole lot more. And you even look back and you're able to even, in my case, appreciate my failures when I've tried to do everything in my power to do things right. I'm able to appreciate those and, and learn from them. So I am able to talk about those knowing that uh, it made my successes a little better and made me motivated to work even harder. So as, as you're listening to, to kind of the success and the failure resumes, if you have questions that you want to ask the panel, I know Adia mentioned this right as we were walking out, feel free to shoot an email to that UW Res Lab account, uh, and we'll try and kind of filter through them, and we're going to finish our questions. We're going to shift over to some questions from the audience. Um, for, our, for our next question, I think, Heather, you started to kind of talk about this. When, when you first were asked to to kind of come up with a success resume and a failure resume. When you started preparing for tonight, what are, what are the stories that, that came to mind first? And, and why do you think they came up? Where did you start with your failure resume? Well, I, I started thinking first about my profession and winning and losing. And for me, it wasn't about, about those things. I, I believe that I hold those I hold sport in a place in my life that it's not like it's not life it's not death so then I go back to when my boyfriend was killed in a car accident once I experienced that at 25 I I knew that there was nothing more important than life so just in terms of going through that the experience of reflecting on 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 my my failures but I guess I go deeper down then and what allowed me to overcome or be, be resilient during that tough time of my life. And kind of going back to my Little League Baseball story about the sports in my life and how the sports in my life and participating in sports actually allowed me to, to overcome a lot of things and give me the confidence that I knew how to get through things, whether it was being the only girl on a team, being um, on deck and watching my husband's brother be walked to get to me, the girl, and then I obviously made good on the opportunity and just give me, it, these things form who you are and they're, they're not good, they're not bad, they're just things. And the good and the bad, if you start rating those, I mean, who's good is good and who's bad is bad. So the whole experience gave me just more clarity to just everyone's life has, has these challenges and some are greater than others, but we all go through them. Yeah, I, I think I went chronologically just because it's, you know, I think failure and adversity and, it, you know, it, it builds you. It's, it's a stepping stone. You become who you are every step of the way, every day, by the failures and the successes you have. And every day there's a, an opportunity to learn and become a different person through that. Um, and so I started chronologically. And, you know, everyone has their story. Everyone has their things. And it's not so much failure. It's just how you were shaped and, how you, and the things that you went through. You know, I, my parents were divorced when I was six. My mom was a single mother at 28, uh, four children, and I was the only girl in my family, and my grandmother took care of us, and that's who I slept with from the time I was about two till I was eight or nine, and my brothers all had a room, and I slept with her, and, um, and you know, I had to learn to fight. I, you know, we didn't have a lot of supervision, so for me, it was about um, being resilient literally physically and mentally from the get-go. I used to have to call my mom at work, and she'd say, just pick up the biggest thing and swing it until I get home. So... Um, <laughs> So that's, that, that's how I learned to be resilient, just literally fighting for myself. And I thank my brothers, my three brothers, for becoming an, for becoming an athlete. I, I don't think I would have been um, a decent athlete if not for them. I mean, you know, I had to run, I had to duck, I had to jump, I had to hit, I had to kick. Um, so those are, those are things that happen. And then at that same time when I wasn't seeing my mom a lot and she was working um, and I didn't really have a relationship with my dad, my mom was in an accident and was in a coma for three or four months. And she wasn't really the same person when she first came out and that was difficult for me. Um, but I really started to gravitate towards people that I thought did the right thing. And um, I think it's something when you talk about resiliency, you have to talk about uh, gratefulness and vulnerability as well. And, and you don't get to be successful without other people. And I think in my life, when I, when I look at every step of the way, everything that I've done, I just am so grateful for the people that have helped me. And it's one thing that I tell young kids all the time, everybody needs help. You don't do any of this by yourself. You don't. You, you cannot become successful by yourself, whether you're in an individual sport or a team sport or, 
you know, a student that's trying to achieve something or get somewhere, you need other people to help you. And I think that's, I don't know why, but I think at a really young age, I recognize that. And I would just gravitate towards people that would help me. And, I, and as I got older, I feel like I got away from letting people help me. I don't like asking for help. Um, and it's something I always have to come back to. We all need it, take it. And certainly when we were 0, 17 and 3, and again, it's not life and death, but it was my livelihood at the time. I just adopted my son, and <laughs> losing my job was not at the top of my docket. Um, it did happen to be the season <laughs> that the football coach went 0 and 12, so I think I skid up the radar. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Tyrone. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> so, but, you know, but Todd Turner at the time, we'd had a great season the year before, and my associate head coach and my best friend Amy Griffin is here, and my godson is here, and uh, she'll tell you that, you know, one of the things that she, she finally had the guts after we'd kept our jobs to, to ask Todd Turner at the time was, why did you keep us? And he said, typically when a coach does that poorly, you've got the parents, you've got the media, you've got donors, you've got people lined up outside the door um, asking for your head. And he said he had the opposite. He had a line outside his door, people threatening him. If they did fire me, they'd be pissed. So that went a long way to me and, and to my staff and meant that I was maybe doing things the right, right, right way. And because I'd leaned on people before and um, I'd shown that you know, I, I could do this job, I, you know, I, it was a real turning point for me in my life to be able to have that kind of failure to get through to the other side. So I started chronologically and went that way with my resume. I guess for me, uh, it made me, as I reflect on all of this, it uh, I just makes me feel very blessed that uh, I was able to go through my life and still going through it with a high level of resiliency and not feel sorry for myself when things didn't go well. I think I'm the type of guy that if the house burns down, uh, instead of laying there crying, watching it burn down, I'm thinking, okay, what do we do next? All right, this is terrible, but what do we do next? What do we do to fix it? And I think it's happened because of what I've had to go through. I talk about my failures academically, athletically, and then even in the coaching profession, but uh, I also, growing up in Compton, California, grew up around gangs and around drugs and, you know, my friends getting shot and not showing up because someone blew their head off. And in my own home, uh, seeing that my uh, father was an alcoholic and a compulsive gambler, gambler and there was domestic violence in the house. All this stuff was going on and it, I, it, was, it was terrible. It was awful, but it was just something. It was an, a, a God-given obsession to continue to fight and not feel sorry for myself. Just continue to fight and persevere and to continue uh, to keep going. My father uh, finished the sixth grade. That was it. And my mother finished the 10th grade. And that was all the education in our home. They were pushing for us to finish high school, let alone go to college. In my mind, all that was too deep. I wasn't thinking about that at the time. I just got to go. I got to get up the next day and I got to push. I got to push. I got to push. And going through all of this, the resume and all that just made me really reflect on all the things that have uh, gone on, good, bad, and different. Do you see concerns about failure or any fear of failure at all? Um, playing itself out in your interactions with your student athletes? Every day. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just speak to that real quick because I, our sport is, is a little bit fail, failure-based. So in a batting average, when you look at success, you, you would be terrible at spelling if your batting average was like your spelling test grade. So you bat 400, you get four out of 10 times you're successful. So six other times you're unsuccessful. So. I, I believe that our sport teaches a lot of life lessons, um, but yes, it's very difficult, I think, nowadays when you've got young people that are somewhat bred to go to play Division I athletics, or many students here at Washington were born and bred to go to a top university, but we experience a lot of, um, a, a lot of perfectionism and a lot of 
wanting to be the, the best and maybe not understanding the process to get to be the best, or we recruit a lot of the best players, maybe not the person that didn't start or not the walk-on necessarily. And so it's very difficult for young people to experience failing because at our level in athletics, they're gonna fail. At our level in the classroom, they are going to be held accountable because you know, no one's kind of scooting them through like maybe they did in high school. So it's, it's evident, we, we see it every day. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things is when you, you know, coach or you teach really ambitious people, driven people, um, you know, there's this, there's this avoidance of risk. They just don't, they don't want to risk something. And sport, to me, is, is the safest and the best place to risk something because it really isn't life and death. It's winning and losing. And um, it's a place where if you can learn that little bit, um, that risk is going to help you improve. Failure is going to help you improve. Um, all of that, or all of those, are going to be lessons to help you uh, be your best in other parts of your life too, not just in sport. Uh, but it, it is. It's tough in this day and age um, when you're faced with with people that they either with young people that don't. Um, they're trying to please someone else. They're trying to prove something for someone else. They have to get those grades because their parents are paying for it. They have to own up to the scholarship they have, or they have to, you know, it's just this, this big pressure cooker to, to be the best and do everything really, really well. Um, it, it's, it's something as an educator and as a coach that you hopefully put your kids in an environment and really realize that they can fail. It is a safe place to be to mess up because that's how you're gonna get better. And, and I think good coaches and good educators do that. Um, for students and for for athletes, um, I learned, and maybe it, hopefully it makes me a better coach than a worse coach. But I, the the law school thing. I went to law school for a year, and my dad was a professional. He was a doctor, and his son, one of my stepdad's other sons, a lawyer. One's a doctor. Blah blah blah. So, it was, and my brothers are all kind of. Mm, I know, loser is not a nice term, but you probably qualify them as that. They're not the most ambitious guys. Um, <laughs> I grew up north of Compton, but they still did drugs. How about that? Um, so, uh, so there was a lot of pressure on me as sort of the one in the family that was achieving things to go to professional school and um, be a lawyer. Even though at the time, I, I just there was one lawyer for every 15 people in the city of San Francisco, and I really liked coaching and I really liked playing, and I was excelling at both. And um, so, quitting law school was a, a big deal because it was a real disappointment to my family, and I felt like I let the world down. And um, I asked to go see a therapist. Like my parents were like, "Why?" I'm like, "Because I just can't. I can't talk about this with anyone that knows me. I need a neutral party." And so the best thing that this person ever told me, and I only went twice because they told me the right thing in those first two deals. Um, well, and I, I just I latched onto it and I ran with it. And I try to tell my student athletes this, and any person I've ever coached that I can tell that the pressure is getting to them, and that there's just some other thing weighing on them is that um, the only person in your life that you need to please is you, and you will be much better off for everybody else. If you make yourself happy, everybody else in your life will be happy for you. If your parents um, are, are upset with you or you feel like they're disappointed, um, at the end of the day, if you end up happy and successful in doing what you want to do, they'll come back around and they'll be happy for you. Um, Nobody is more proud of me that I'm the coach at the University of Washington and I've achieved what I've achieved than my mother. Um, the year I quit law school, I can't tell you that that was the case. But when I was told that I needed, I knew what was going to make me happy. And if I can get, you know, my student athletes to believe that, if they make themselves happy first and the other people around them will be happy, then I feel like I've maybe had a little bit of an influence on them. But um, I think that's one of the biggest things about, you know, failure is that you, you have to figure out what you, where your path is. I have nothing to add, Your Honor. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Last, last question from, from us, and then we'll turn it over to, uh, to questions from all of you. What opportunities did the failures that you've experienced present for, for learning or professional development? I know Heather ended her failure resume with not getting a call back from UW, so I feel like there's a little unfinished storytelling there. Oh, gosh. Yes, I... I, there's a lot to tell in that story, but the, the basic message to the story of me achieving the head coaching position at 29 years old, where I had no head coaching um, experience at all, I, I, I knew that I had the, the mental toughness and the fortitude to, to lead the program that I played for, even though other people might not have seen it. Thank 
goodness, Leslie was on the search committee because she, she somehow saw in me at least a chance um, two months after I turned my resume in to, to give me a call. And it was an interesting process, but I was told no a million more times than I was told yes. And luckily, I didn't accept the no for the 10 millionth time um, because I, I pursued the opportunity two months later in a backwards route. So the online resume thing, I, I learned through this experience that it's, it's good to do, but it's not gonna get you the job. It's, it's how do you prove who you are to the people that, that are gonna make the decisions. And fortunately for me, I found a way around the system to get to the people like Leslie Gallimore and Angie Marzetta, who is my former teammate at the time, um, just to get in the door. And I know if, if I hadn't overcome some of the things I had overcome in my life, I would never have even had the confidence to pursue the job. I, I should not have gotten the job, actually. Um, but <laughs> I, I, I proved I, I could do it. And I, I went in there prepared, and I went in with a little bit of a, a roundabout approach about how I was going to lead the program that I played for. And um, I, I just knew that I wasn't going to stop at no because it was something that I really, really wanted to do. And I have always, I guess, grown up with a prove it um, type of an attitude, obvious reasons, the baseball stuff and being the only girl. And that's kind of my, the way I cut my teeth and the way I go about my business is I'm kind of always the underdog and I'm always going to prove people, people wrong. So. You didn't talk last time, so you go up over <laughs> I'll give you the one I asked, Heather. What opportunities did the failures that you were talking about present for learning or professional development? But I also, you know, Leslie, you were talking a little bit more about risk taking as well. And so maybe for you two, I'd like to hear kind of what's your framework for taking risks or approaching really difficult tasks? Uh, and how do you think that framework has maybe been shaped by some of the, the failures and setbacks you've faced? In my opinion, when it's something that you really believe that you can do, you don't think you're taking a risk. You are totally confident, I'm going to get this done. It may seem like a risk to everybody else, mm -hmm. but not to me. I'm going to get this done. So I don't, I don't see it that way. But the, the other question you ask, I may not answer it at all, but I, I still want to say this. Yeah. If my parents, now my parents made a lot of mistakes, I talked about my father, his lifestyle, that sort of thing. But if my parents would have not held me accountable for some other areas, and if they would have blamed everyone else for my mistakes, I wouldn't have made it. If my parents raised me the way, or dealt with me the way a lot of parents, quite frankly, that we deal with as coaches, become enable, enablers. There's a sense of entitlement. There's a, because they show up, they're supposed to have the world given to them. I would not have made it because I would have blamed everyone else. I was taught if you make a mistake, you own up to it. And you trying to way, try to find a way to fix it. So those failures would have turned into excuses why it's everyone else's fault as opposed to my own and i wouldn't have been as motivated because it's not my fault everybody's out to get me so i think thank god for that yeah. I think there has to be a willingness to change i mean you know when something doesn't go well you have to figure out why um, and I, I'm with Lorenzo as, as a coach, uh, as someone in charge of people or someone who's considered to be a leader, you, you, have, to, um, you have to be willing to change and you have to, be look, you have to really be willing to self-reflect and dig deep into what matters to you and, and to continue to have the confidence that, you know, it's not a risk. I know I can get this done, but maybe I need to do it differently than I did last time. And what were the reasons for the failure? And sometimes take the emotion out of it because it, it's, it is an emotional job. Um, and when, when everyone, in their you know, mother and father has their opinion on how you do something, it, it's hard to ignore at times. Uh, but you have to surround yourself with, one, people that believe in you, but also with people that will, will tell you. You know, people that you trust that will tell you the hard thing. Um, and, you know, my players on my team know that sometimes they'll hear the difficult thing from me, but it comes from a place of caring. 
Um, I'm telling you this because I really think it's going to make you better. I think you're selling yourself short. And it's the same thing. You have to self-reflect in that same way. And you have to be willing to change. And I, I'm a little bit slow to change sometimes because I, I really need to have the feeling that it's going to work. Um, uh, but at the same time, you know, I, I've become much better uh, later on in my coaching career of, of doing that, really digging deep and, and being willing to change things that, that maybe didn't work before. We're going to take a couple of questions from, from the audience, and we're going to have uh, Audium and Pam, if you guys want to use the mic up top. They've been going through and looking at the emails you've sent in and are picking out a couple, couple of questions here. Hello. Oh, you know awesome. Like Anne said, my name is Audium, and I work here at UW in Academic Support Program. I'm Pam. I work in Student Athlete Academic um, Services. So you all have some awesome questions. It's like almost impossible to pick. So luckily there's some themes. So we're gonna start off very kind of intro level question for you coaches. What advice would you give college students about failure as a part of the process of succeeding? I, I would just say that, you know, failure is not the worst thing on earth, but, but it's not the best either. <laughs> You know, you can't just embrace it and say, yep, oh, failure, I'm going to learn something from this. I, I think sometimes failure comes from laziness, to be honest, or just, you know, thinking that things are going to come a little bit easier for you. Uh, you know, if, if, you, if you know you've tried your best, if you know you've put everything into what it is you've done wholeheartedly and you still come up short, then pat yourself on the back and say, okay, why? Now what else do I need to do to fix it? Um, but don't just say, oh, well, that didn't go well, and think that, you know, it's going to go well next time when you've put no effort towards it. So, you know, it's that, it's that balance between where's your ownership in it and where's your accountability in trying to get where you're going with either your sport or your academics or your life or your relationships. Um, what part do you play in it? And, and what part maybe needs to change to have a better outcome? Or if you did everything you possibly could, what's the lesson there? And then where do you find that resilience to say, you know what, it didn't work out for me that time, but I'm still going to try to do this. I think it's only, if, if you have the basic makeup and talents and abilities to do something, it, you're only a failure when you quit trying. Uh, forgive me as I digress a bit, but one of my favorite cartoons growing up was the Roadrunner and the Coyote. Now, beep, beep. you may not have ever, that's right, BB, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and it, how, how many know about the Roadrunner and the Coyote? Oh, sweet. Okay. As I got older, it kind of ticked me off that the coyote went to long lengths to order all the stuff from Acme <laughs> to really calculate this trap to get the roadrunner, and he would have it, and out of nowhere, an unexpected leaf would just fall and get in the way, and it wouldn't work. In the next episode, he was trying something else. No, go back and just wait for the leaf not to fall. That was going to work. <laughs> but you quit too early. And I think that we do that a lot of times where we, it, we're almost there, we're almost there, and we just listen to others that say we can't do it. And maybe we don't have the self-esteem that we need to have, and we don't feel that we're able to get it done, and we quit just as we were about to get over the hump and experience success. I could sing the theme song to that, but I'll spare everybody. <laughs> Coyote's <Yeah>. after you. <laughs> Good runner. <laughs> Catches you. Okay. Yeah, that, was an, that was an anvil, not a leaf. That was the most different episode. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So the, the next question is more towards kind of, some of you shared some of this in your story, more towards you. So what resources, support system, inner voice, et cetera, made the biggest difference for you in overcoming challenges? I would just say my parents and my friends, the friends that I keep, I try to keep people that are just a little bit smarter than me and a little bit better than me. So when I need some advice, I can go to them for advice. I'm not always the one giving the advice. And then, of course, I've been so lucky to have two parents that are the best people in the world. And I'm hopeful that everybody has that in their lives. But I would go to my friends and my parents and my husband. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> we won't tell them. Don't worry. Yeah. Sorry. I don't, I don't 
have. I just, can I ask a question? Sure. Sorry. Did you talk trash when you hit that grand slam to those guys <laughs> as you run around the bases? No, because you're only as good as the next at bat, not that at bat. Whoa, that's good. That's good. I would have talked trash. <laughs> the, the Is that your resource coach, Omar? <laughs> I think, well, I think Heather's right. You have to surround yourself with people that lift you up, that don't try to push you down, you know? That they're gonna challenge you and back to accountability and ownership and not tell you the easy thing, just, you know, not tell you what you wanna hear, but be honest and truthful. I mean, I think honesty is one of the biggest things that I value. And if you can give honesty to people, you have to be able to take honesty as well. And sometimes it's not the easiest thing to hear, but I, I, I think you, if you place a high value on that, and you have people around you that are willing to be honest, that you're, you're gonna have a better time of it. Okay, so um, some of you talked about this too, but um, in thinking about how many times you've been told no, potentially, or you actually have, right? Um, maybe you didn't tell us some other stories, but have. Where do you find the motivation to keep going, even though it's hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel? Well, I, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the movie Stand and Deliver, but it's about the, the math teacher. And if you haven't seen it, you should just at least look at some of the quotes on YouTube about it. But I was thinking about this the other day, and thinking about kind of how Coach Rummer was talking about how in, in times nowadays, I think people are, are trying to achieve success in academics, young people, because their parents want them to. And they maybe don't have the vision for themselves of what they want to do because maybe it's always been told what they're supposed to do and what they're gonna do and, and all of that. But I would say for me personally, why I think somehow I've been blessed with the, the mindset of I've always wanted to do things or I've always been at least allowed to try things and then if if I said I wanted to do it and I'm doing it and I it came up short or I didn't I didn't do what I wanted to do it was what I wanted to do and I wasn't doing it for this person and then this person and then this person and so that's the that's a difficult thing nowadays and I I have my philosophies on why but it's hard if you're doing things for other people because it's hard to serve a million different people serve yourself Anybody want that? No? It's a good answer. Yeah, it's a great answer. We're going to go with Heather's answer. <laughs> good job. Um, okay, so discussing failure involves being very vulnerable, which you all have done today. We thank you for that. Do you encourage your players to practice vulnerability, and how can we become more comfortable with vulnerability? Us males <laughs> have a tendency to uh, internalize a whole lot. And uh, we have a tendency to feel like we have to be man enough to handle it by ourselves and take care of it. We don't, we don't need any help. And we try to talk to our guys uh, about that. It might be what your boys uh, around the corner are saying, but that, that doesn't make a real man. I think a real man, I'm speaking men at this point, uh, are able to be vulnerable. I think. You're only able to get better when you can become vulnerable and you can look inside yourself and you have a few friends that will tell you exactly how they feel about you. And when you're wrong, you're wrong. And they point it out and you don't argue back. You listen and you take it. If you can't accept criticism, you can't improve. You've already, you already have all the, all the answers. A uh, famous coach named John Wooden said, it's what you learn when you know it all, that counts. That's when you really start learning. And I think that's very, very important. Yeah, we talk about it on our team, and <clears throat> there are also stoic women that have trouble with it as well. <laughs> One that might be sitting next to you. <laughs> I have three daughters. Yeah. Um, <laughs> only girl in a family of boys, and sort of the one that the pressure was put on, and. So you, you, you feel like you have to be strong and you do feel like you have to take everything so it's hard to preach that message to your, your players or your team when maybe you're not showing that yourself all the time. And I think as a, as a, as a female coach and you know, 
in, in most sports, you know, there are way more men that coach. And I'm in a man's profession. Heather's in a man's profession. If you look at the numbers, we're in a man's world. And so um, it, there is a little bit of gender bias and difference between how you act and how your players view you. And I, I end up with some players on my team who um, have never been coached by a female. Um, they've had all male coaches growing up. So it's a little bit different, you know, how you um, have that relationship and let them get to know you as a person. But I do think it's important. Um, but what's what's that boundary? What what's what's an overshare? What's what's them knowing too much about you personally, and then not seeing you as their head coach or the person that they go to, um, you know, to learn about their sport and get better. So it's a it's a fine line. Uh, but we try to on our team. Um, every year because it's different because you lose players and you gain players but in our dynamic we try to make sure that they feel it's a safe place that they're not going to be ridiculed for how they're feeling how they're doing what they're sharing who they are as a person where they come from what their background is um, we really try to embrace uh, being on a team as being part of a family that you need to be comfortable uh, sharing things about yourself that um, maybe make you who you are. You know, you talk about walking in someone else's shoes. You just don't know what someone else has gone through to get where they are and why they act and behave the way they behave. And if you can figure that out and have empathy and compassion, then I think it goes a long way. But if it's if if you they don't feel comfortable um, being themselves, then you're never going to help them or help your team be the best that they can be. It's amazing how much a person's hearing improves when you say I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong. Huh? What? What'd you say? <laughs> Their interest peaks really quickly just to say I was wrong. And having someone under myself, you know, me being in a leadership position, for them to hear their leader say he's wrong, uh, it makes them, I think, uh, they become a little more vulnerable and I think they see, you know what? It's okay. It's okay. If, if he could do it, I, I guess I could admit when I'm wrong. So uh, I have a question, and I'm going to say it's for all of you. Ann and Ed, feel free to answer if you feel like. Um, there's lots of children. I'm really excited that people brought their families. There's also lots of parents in the room, and you all have talked about being parents or your parents. So the question is, what would you say to parents about how to prepare their children for the reality and inevitability of failure? What would you say to your children? <laughs> Um, you know, there's a lot of studies being done, and you can go on Facebook every day and see an article written about helicopter parents. Is anybody in here a helicopter parent? <laughs> Probably. I was like, Where are you? Or a tiger mom? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, I think it's, you know, the world, I, we, everyone talks about the old days and how you used to be able to go down the street and do whatever, and your parents never really, that's how I grew up. No one ever really watched me. I just came home at night somehow. I came back <laughs> safely. I got through. Didn't happen for every kid, I don't think, but it just wasn't as big of a worry. And I think we really, same as a parent, you know, you worry about your kids. You worry that they're going to be liked. You worry that they're going to be safe. You just, you worry. It's, it's part of being a parent. Um, and you just, you know, you have to take a deep breath and if you're showing them the right way and you're letting them fall on their face and get up again, that that's the biggest service you can do them. Uh, you know, the biggest disservice you can do them is make it okay and make everything seem great and hunky-dory all the time. And it doesn't mean that you don't love them. It doesn't mean that you don't give them praise when they earn praise and deserve praise. But at the same time, you can't just um, make them feel like, you know, the, everything is, is great all the time, that being the best is the, the penultimate thing. It's, it's not. It's just doing what they love and being passionate about something and finding their own path and supporting them in it. Um, and that's way easier to say than do in this day and age, I think, because there's a lot of pressure um, from, from everyone. I mean, and, and it starts with the parents. I think the parents feel the pressure that just gets put right on their kids. I mean, hang around the Northeast cluster of Seattle in some, in a PTA meeting or with, I mean, it's a crazy place out there. <laughs> it is. I mean, when I, I, I adopted my son, so I became a parent when he was in third grade. Um, and the number of people telling me to change my address and put my gas bill so we could go to this elementary school instead of this one, I'm like, why can't we just go to the one we're supposed to go to? Well, you don't want to go there. That's where, you know, I'm like, they don't have APP, they don't have, I'm like, I don't care. I just, I want it to be easy for me. <laughs> so, I want it to be convenient for me. I'm busy. Um, so, you know, I, I, it was just a, an interesting thing to be plopped into the middle of. And there's, there's a lot of pressure from every different direction. And 
Um, I'm a firm believer. I'm like Heather that I, I got to where I am because I was allowed to try things. I asked my mom, can I be a Girl Scout? She'd been a dead mother for my brothers and Boy Scouts, and um, it was the worst experience of her life. So she said, no, you can't be a Girl Scout. What else do you want to do? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> she said, what's cheap? I said, I don't know. She said, well, this soccer thing, it doesn't cost anything. You just need a pair of shoes. Let's do that. And I'm like, all right, I'll do that. And then, but then one thing led to another, and she never told me that I couldn't try something. And um, and whether I failed or succeeded, she didn't care, just as long as I was doing something. It just was never about her. When she came to watch, she was like, oh, you know, even when I was at Cal, that wasn't your best game. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> you know? I, so, thanks for coming. Um, I mean, she, she had no, and, but at the end of the day, she loved me still. So, it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to do. But, um, you know, I think reading up on what a helicopter parent is or a tiger mom is will help parents sort of let go a little bit. And, uh, you know, we... On our team, one of the things we really try to do, we want kids to love their parents and embrace their families, but we also want them to have it be a separate thing. We want them in our family. And youth soccer parents are some of the, you know, <laughs> most interesting people out there. <laughs> and um, so trying to get our players to understand that to, to learn and to develop and to be a part of this and really take advantage of this time in their lives, they, they need to separate. Um, and your parents can still love you, they can still cheer for our team, not just for you, and they can, you know, they can want for you and want your success, but they're, you know, they need to be at, at a little bit of an arm's length, and um, we're here to help you embrace failure, because it's going to happen in sports, and we're here to, you know, get you over the hump, and nobody has a perfect career from day one to the last day that they're here. There's always going to be a speed bump that they hit, and that's what, that's what the fun part is, is, is coming out on the other side of it, for sure. I've, I've had an interesting conversation with the father. Oh, no, you, you're, the, you're, the, you're the coach. You, no, you're, you're the man. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is the man. Yeah, go ahead. I grew up just, the co just up the coast from, from um, Coach Romar. He used to measure my success by, by his success. He didn't even know I existed at the time, but we had this magazine called Street and Smith's Magazines that would lay out the best players and the high school players in the country. And his picture would always be in it, and my aspiration was to kind of be like, like that. And, and it would always come up just a little bit short. <laughs> um, I had the, back to the parent question, I had this inter in interesting interaction with the, with the father um, last year who was complaining about the grade that his son got out of paper. And I said, you know, I, I know our faculty, they're, they're, they're pretty good. And he said, well, no, no, trust me, this was an A paper because I wrote that paper. <laughs> and he slipped and said it. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 I, and, and, I, and I and I and I have this interesting position now because sometimes people mistake me for the director of admissions. So so I'm the most popular guy at parties, right? So people come up to me and they want to talk to me, and then they and then they'll say, "Well, I have a 17 year old at such and such a high school, and we're trying to figure out whether we should take AP chemistry." And I'll just think, "We we." Take, <laughs> Or should we take? <laughs> should we? Yeah. And, and I and I and, and so the we the we factor, <laughs> and and then I'll 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 have to say, the most important thing that you can do for your son or daughter right now is separate your sense of self from from their successes. And when I realized it with my own son and my own daughter, that that how they perform in the world is not a reflection on on me. It's not about me. And so this centering ourselves in relationship to our, to our kids, I think, is a really, really hard thing to do. Just simply unequivocal love is, I think, what we're, what we're here for. And the lovely thing about athletics is that at some point, kids have to put, the data is the data, that either you can run, or you can jump, or you can play, and you perform. And, and, and it's as honest as anything that we can do. It's just simply honest. That the, truth, the truth is there in their performance. My team would give you snaps for that. Ready here? Yeah, some of them. Coach Romar, did you want to share on that one? Well, he speaks so eloquently, I don't want to really follow him, but uh, our youngest daughter went to the University of Washington and was on the dance team. And, you know, I said she, she was chilly, but she says, no, it's a dance team. So I changed, it's the, on the dance team. As a high school student, she would go to New York to participate in uh, Alvin Ailey, Alvin Ailey, Al, say it. Alvin Ailey. Alvin Ailey. Alvin Ailey. And she did it for several years. Well, now she was coming in as a freshman here at the University of Washington, 
And she wanted to do it again because she enjoyed her experience so much. However, that would mean she was going to miss some practices early for the dance team here. And if you miss early practices, you're not allowed to cheer in the first games. She was aware of it. I was aware of it. She went on her annual trip to Alvin Ailey. And when she came back, she says to me, yeah, the uh, first football game is going on this week. And uh, yeah, of course, I'm not going to be able to because, you know, I decided to do what I did. <laughs> hint, hint. I said, that, that, that was the rule, right? She said, yeah. I said, yeah, well, then you got to miss some games. She said, yeah, I knew you were going to say that. I was just saying. <laughs> But I know many of parents that would take the position of, I'm going to, they're going to be upset with the dance team coach. How could you do this to my child? They've been doing this every summer. And you're going to de deprive her of some, some fun. She enjoys this. And it's ridiculous. Please don't do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll add in a comment. I have to be thoughtful since my parents are here. <laughs> um, so I, I didn't get to give much of my background, but I, I played soccer and I rode in college. And I remember in that- Just at Harvard. Just at Harvard. <laughs> in, in, that, in that recruiting process, when I was talking to coaches, uh, the feedback I got from coaches was not what I expected. They were, they were kind of surprised that they were actually interacting with me and not with my parents. My parents kind of, you know, were, were kind enough to take a step back and just kind of let me have that as my own experience and make my own decisions. And you know, the coaches were like, this, this is kind of refreshing. So it's, it's nicer as the adults who want to be working with your students to have that opportunity to really be working with them as opposed to with parents. So along with that, you know, we all work at the University of Washington, and we all want the best for all of you who are kind of undergrads, grad students. Uh, this is a good place to take some risks, and it's a good place to practice failing, because we are here to help you, to catch you, to, to help get you back on your feet when you stumble. And, and so do take, take some opportunities here, so that when you take a step out into the world, this you'll have some failure resumes and some items you can talk about at that, that job interview. And they're like, tell us, tell us something that didn't go well. Have that story ready and, and practice it here. And that might mean kind of getting, getting an arm's length from your parents kind of in that process. I see that my question askers have sat down, and I, I think that might be an indication that it's about time to wrap up. Um, I'll first ask, is there any last thoughts that you wanted to share before I close? I would just say because I was in on, um, on her interview, and maybe I did have a little bit of something, Heather getting a, a call to come and interview for the head coaching job at the University of Washington. and. I think she's a great example. I, I was coaching here when Heather played, um, so I knew her. I didn't know her well, but I knew her, and, uh, and she did. She, I mean, she fought, she scrapped, she clawed to get herself in that room somehow, some way, and it wasn't like she was on the phone begging people, come on, you know, whatever, but her, uh, she had a five-year plan on how she was going to win a national championship. She knew everything there was to know about University of Washington softball because she was there from its infancy um, and on, and at the end of the day, when she came in and she interviewed, and We've all now been on tons of interview committees with people that come and go throughout the athletic department who want jobs and are trying to convince us why they're the best one. I would say that um, resiliency is probably the thing that came through um, from Heather the most, was that, uh, you know, she, she, one, she had the confidence that she could do it, but she wasn't coming in in a way that, uh, that, that was arrogant at all. It was uh, in a way that, you know what, I've, I've done this and bounced back. I've done this and I've bounced back. And I've done this and I've bounced back and I've, you know, blah, blah, blah. blah. And you're like, you know, who else do you want for your head coach? Someone who just thinks that, you know, it's all going to be smooth sailing and they're going to crumble or get canned or do something the wrong way when, you know, just to get a win. Um, so everything in her interview, it, it was the best 
I want to say it's one of my success stories because the other person in the room that wanted her there, um, we, were, we were not in the majority uh, and we'd already interviewed some big, big time names and people who were asking for a ridiculous amounts of money um, to come co coach our softball program and she was by far the youngest and least experienced. Um, but it, you know, the minute she finished her interview and walked out, it was kind of <laughs> dropped the mic and everyone looked at us and we're like, that's it, right there. And you know, five years later, her little plan, she won a national championship and proved us even more right. So um, she's a great success story. Any other last thoughts? Do you, you go for the summation well, or something? Well, I, I, I just want to, to acknowledge a, a few people and for having the courage to even, even think of this kind of, of conversation. And, and of all things, for, co for coaches who are, who are so in the, in the public eye, um, to have the, the courage and the temerity to actually sit and, and, and talk about um, that which didn't go, go so, so well. And, and what you're modeling for, for us, those that are, that are students that are here and, and, and faculty and, and, and staff, um, you're, you're giving us permission in some way, and I, th I think especially the, the young man who was walking over as we were coming here, um, who believes he failed his, his math midterm. Today. And, um, and, and it's a midterm, and, and what you do next is, is you go back and you do more of it again with the, with the hope and the faith that, that, that things will be okay. At the, at, at some point, or um, for those of us who are, who are faculty members, you know, as we teach, we read those course evaluations, we look at those evaluations, and we find that that one um, or two or twenty <laughs> that, that say we're not so good at this, and the kind of and and students, you have no idea the kind of pain and anguish that 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 that, that got. I mean, the, the 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 number of nights that we stay awake thinking, was I really that was I really that bad? And to stay in this profession, you, you actually have to teach again. You have to walk in front of the class yet, yet again. Um, and I know that there are students that have experienced loss of, of, of loved ones, of close ones, and, and, we, and we stay here, and we're, and we're here for a reason. Um, so there's something very powerful about, about the concept of, of resilience and continuing to try and continuing to, to, to work and have a clear sense of who we are in relation to um, to that which we do well and that which we don't do do so well, and you give us permission to to be whole and full in in this in this world, and so thank you for that. And so I thank all of you for being a part of the conversation. Yes. So please join me in thanking our panel. I'd like to also thank uh, Undergraduate Academic Affairs and everybody who's a part of our Resilience Lab as well. It's been an awesome partnership. And lastly, thank you for being out here tonight and taking your time to spend with us. Happy midterm season.